Hello everyone and welcome to a very special video from Social Flight where we celebrate an amazing figure from World War II which is Bill Tiger Lyons who flew a P-51D Mustang as part of the 357th Fighter Squadron, the 355th Fighter Group and the 8th Air Force. I had the good fortune of being able to meet Bill uh, through a connection of a gentleman by the name of Mark Murphy, who flies uh, some amazing historic aircraft, one of which is painted in the livery that Bill Tiger Lyons flew in World War II. And so he made the connection and I was able to go down and actually meet Bill when he gave a presentation on how to fly the P-51D Mustang. Bill is 100 years young as of the making of this video, a truly amazing individual. I will say, uh, you know, he flew 63 aerial combat missions. He had three aerial victories. He uh, was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross Air Medal with eight oak leaves, two presidential unit citations and five battle stars to the EU theater, the European theater ribbon uh, for his service. Really, really an amazing individual. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over so you can see the presentation that we attended directly with Bill Lyons. And uh, he will be coming on our show on Social Flight Live uh, soon. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. With that, I'd like to introduce Bill Tiger Lyons. I, uh, it was my first week here at uh, Kendall, and I went down to the uh, lunchroom, the bistro, uh, to meet Carol. <clears throat> and uh, there were a few seats empty, and we took one, two seats. And uh, opposite on the other side of the table was a... Uh, a resident, another inmate. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, I started uh, to chat and I said, we're new here. And he said, welcome to Kendall. And uh, as we spoke, uh, I detected that he had a Teutonic accent, German. And I asked him, are, are you from Germany? And he said, yes, and uh, why? Uh, I, know, I said, I know Germany, I, I flew over it quite a bit. And he said, during the war? And I said, yes. And he said, and I was a teenage ground crew anti-aircraft gunner trying to shoot you down. And we looked at each other and uh, we reached over and shook hands. And uh, that was a, a very meaningful moment. I had nothing against this fellow years ago. He had nothing against me, and yet we were trying to harm each other. And I saw the, the absurdity of it, the almost obscenity of it, uh, and here we were, we were going to live in the same place. And uh, I would like this presentation uh, to be received, and tr I'll try to make it uh, in the friendly spirit and that uh, that handshake had. And I would appreciate it if you would accept it in that way too. It is not a wartime uh, exaltation. It's much more, uh, I would like to say factual, that's all. But my feelings are quite different today than they were then. And I understand more and uh, but this all happened, and they're all facts, and you should know them if you don't. Okay. Okay. Let's learn to fly the P-51 Mustang fighter plane at Kendall. Oh, at the bottom, uh, Bill Tiger Lyons. 
I'm, I'm, I'm no longer Tiger. I am, no, I'm, I'm a real pussycat, okay? So, okay, let's go. And this is the Mustang. Uh, it's, uh, in this version, it has been changed four times, four times that were afterthoughts, that, and each time that it made it better. And you'll see what happens. It, it was the iconic plane of its time, state of the art. Okay, now, uh, the promise here is that you're going to learn to fly the P-51. And uh, the first thing you have to do is uh, you first go to the Nashville TV uh, classification center and you will be tested uh, in, a, in a very strange way. You, you, like no test you've, you've ever had before. They will try to find out what your home life was like, whether you have any hang-ups, whether you've been arrested, and uh, another question was, have you been in any fights? And, uh, okay, we can continue on. Uh, I, had a, I wrote a 15-page letter to my parents detailing every test that was done at Nashville. And I can assure you, with your maturity, knowledge, and uh, intelligence, you could pass all of those tests if you tried. Okay, next. Uh, see, you passed them. Congratulations. You are now uh, able to go on to uh, uh, be an aviation cadet. And first we go to pre-flight, next, pre-flight training at Maxwell Field, Montgomery, Alabama. And this was uh, a fairly grueling uh, physical time for uh, us. We, uh, there were upper classmen and lower classmen, and as lower classmen, we were subject to a great deal of hazing. And we all accepted it, and uh, the upper classmen relished it, and then we became upper classmen and, and uh, hazed the lower classmen. You would be walking along and someone would say, uh, upper classmen would spot you with your tag on and say, uh, do 15 push-ups, grunt. And you had to go down and do 15 push-ups and you walked another uh, 20 feet and some other other classmen would ask you to do the same thing. You develop muscles very quickly. But they were good. They were good. I wanted to, de to get better developed. And, oh, I had been on uh, the gym team at Brooklyn Tech, so I loved to do it. And then they left me alone because I, I didn't uh, look like I was having trouble. They wanted uh, cadets that had trouble in doing the push-ups. Okay, next. Now, you've gone through uh, pre-flight. Oh, and you've learned... Uh, uh, the, some of the things about airplanes, uh, engines, and, uh, and now you're ready for primary flight training, which is, uh, at that time, virtually nobody had ever been up in an airplane among the cadets. Today, it's commonplace. I doubt if 1% had ever flown an airplane. And here we were going to be flying. Uh, this was at Union City, City, Tennessee, and we had two months of uh, uh, primary, uh, and uh, you had to be able to solo uh, after about 15, no, excuse me, 12 hours, and otherwise you were probably going to be washed out. That is eliminated from uh, the training program. And I, I saw it in about seven hours. One of the main things was learning how to control the airplane. And I'm going to demonstrate. Pretend this is the stick that you used right in front of you, between the knees, a stick. 
to control the airplane. This simple stick. And you also had two foot pedals on the bottom. Right foot pedal, left foot pedal. And when you pulled back on the stick, the plane went up. When you push forward on the stick, the plane went down. And when you press, pull the stick to the right, the plane banked to the right, to the left, banked to the left. Okay, what happens when I pull back on the stick? Audience, what happens? <laughs> Correct. See, the first time you got it. Okay. When I push forward, what do you do? Go down. To the right? Right, back to the right. To the left? Back to the left. Okay, now you add the foot pedals into that. If I pressed on the right foot pedal, that, the, uh, the rudder was controlled by the foot pedals. The uh, stick controlled the ends of the wings, which flipped down, just, just the very ends flipped down or flipped up. And, and made the plane go up or down. And the foot pedals gave direction right or left. So if I pushed in the foot pedal to the right and made the stick go to the right, what would happen to the plane as it curved around? It would go up and right. It would go right very smoothly, very smooth. The same thing, it would go to the left. If I put the stick to the left, and the foot pedal on the rudder to the left, it would smoothly make it a left turn. Okay, so you've learned a lot. <laughs> L, suppose I pull the stick to the back, where would it go? Up. Correct. Good. Jack, suppose I push the stick down, where would it go? Down. Correct. Good. All right, continuing. Uh, Oh, all right. Uh, after we passed uh, primary, primary flight training, we uh, are, go on to basic flying, uh, basic flight training. And these uh, planes had 200 horsepower. I, I should have mentioned that the primary flight uh, uh, plane had only 120 horsepower. So you're getting almost double the horsepower, and your plane would go faster and you could do more things with it uh, that uh, were like a, a later fighter plane that you would be flying. And we got two months of this, of a speedier plane, a plane that would do more, and we get, became more and more proficient at stick and rudder flying. And that's all there is to, add, uh, to, plane, uh, to flying a plane, in, uh, at least in World War II. Stick and rudder flying. Okay, we'll go on to the next. And then you go on to advanced flight training. And for the first time, you have retractable landing gears. And you have a 500 horsepower engine. And that could pull you through acrobatics. You could go up and around and turn over at the top if you did it skillfully. And that's called an immelman. Uh, or you could do loops, and you could do all sorts of uh, uh, acrobatics with this particular plane. And it readied you for the next phase in training, uh, go ahead, which is called operational training. And there you had your first fighter plane, war-weary P-40s that uh, had 1,100 horsepower, but it was a real fighter plane, and uh, I remember, uh, oh, by the way, in every one of the uh, previous uh, uh, areas of training, you had instructors telling you what to do, and they were with you for the first half of your training uh, in those periods, and they got out and let you fly uh, yourself for the re remaining half of the training. Okay, so we were uh, in operational training, three or four, there were four of us, uh, and the instructor was uh, telling us uh, we were standing on the wings either side looking into the cockpit, and he was explaining some things in the cockpit and, uh, where you had your throttle 
where you had your, uh, your, 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 your two pedals for the rudders and, and the stick was the same. Everything was the same in terms of how you flew this. And uh, we all got off the wings and uh, he said, okay, uh, Georgie, uh, that was his fellow's name, take her up. What? Take her up? He'd never been in the plane. Your first flight in a fighter plane is solo. Think about that. I'm going to repeat that. Your first flight in a fighter plane is solo. It's going to go twice as fast as anything you've ever flown, and uh, you better know what you're doing. Well, each of us did get in when we were told to, and uh, we flew around and landed. Everybody landed safely, uh, and it was an, a great feeling to be able to do that. And at uh, operational training, we got another two months, and then uh, we go on to uh, the next plane, which was the P-51. Look at that, look at that uh, frontal area. It's all wing and a little bit of fuselage, and that's what someone might see in his rear view mirror. And you don't ever want to see that, the rear view mirror, if you're the enemy. That's what you would see. A beautiful, sleek airplane, very little frontal area, a very thin wing, and, well, eight machine guns. Okay, six machine guns, sorry. And uh, this was the more daunting part of, of, uh, of, of flying. And this is a P-51 cockpit, all right? As I say, it, it seems to be daunting just at the start, but then come closer. Oh, wait a minute, don't, don't go yet. On the right are, are your uh, flaps down, where is it? Oh, I don't have my, don't ever, don't ever behave like this in training. Okay. No, I want to go to the right, all the way to the right, lower right. That's where your, uh, your landing gear is, and it's, it's just a crank, and you push it down. And go to the left alongside the uh, upper, go a little up to the left, and that's where your throttle is. And there are three things on the throttle. There's your gas, your prop pitch, which enables you to take a bigger bite out of the air by turning the propeller sharper into the in, into the where you're going into the wind, and the third thing is your uh, fuel mixture. You can enrich your fuel mixture or lean it out. You lean it out when you're cruising uh, at a fairly constant speed and want to use up less gas and so forth. All right, now. Go to this, okay, we're closing in on the dials. These are the things that you look at all the time with glances, with glances. Now, it's, you can't read every dial all the time, and yet you have to know what all the dials are doing. So you learn gradually where the needle is pointing when it's in the right area of each dial, and when you learn that, you can look at this whole board, this whole uh, array of dials, and you know you're doing the right thing. If the needles are pointed uh, in the, at the right angle, that's it, you can't tell the pointers, uh, at the right angle for each dial. And it became second nature to just glance at, uh, well, a little faster uh, than that, but glance because most most of what you're trying to do is look around to see what's going on uh, in the sky and try to spot any enemy aircraft whenever you're flying and we had swivel heads uh, uh, for that uh, main uh, effort okay next That's where are you going right there That's what you're talking about the fuel tanks and the fuel gauge right there are we, do we have enough gas? 
Okay. Uh, anyway, there's your stick down there. Show that, please. See it? Well, you, you made it harder. Okay, there's your stick. Now show it in the, in, the, uh, in the dial area. Okay, do you see it? Much bigger. Okay. Uh, so, you've already learned how to control an airplane. You know what your foot pedals are for, the rudder. You know what your stick is for. Go right, left, bank, pull back, go forward, push forward. You know how to fly a P-51 fighter plane. Okay? And I, I applaud you. I applaud you. All right. I'm going to now do a, uh, a little history. Uh, the air war in Europe first uh, in 1940 was the Blitz against England, and uh, the Spitfires were able to uh, down many, many of the planes that Hitler was flying over and dropping uh, bombs indiscriminately. And uh, the Spitfire was a, a superb plane uh, that had a low wing loading. It had a wonderful engine, wonderful, the, the, the Merlin Rolls-Royce engine, uh, which was 50, 1,650 horsepower and uh, could pull this rather light plane through the air beautifully and uh, very often out turn the measurements and because it had, as I say, this lower wing loading, a light plane. Uh, okay, next, uh, 1942 is when uh, daytime bombing by, by U.S. bombers started to come over uh, uh, to England at airfields all over East Anglia and uh, was sent against Germany and they had the P-47 fighter escort, which was an excellent plane, but I'll show you had a shortcoming. Uh, and here is, a, is a, an example of a small part of a B-17, uh, uh, in, B-17's in formation. I want to talk about the B-17's now. The B, no, go back, please, okay. Uh, the B-17 had 10 guns, 10, two in the machine guns, two in the front, two in the rear, two on the top in a turret, uh, two on the bottom in a ball turret. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Terrible place. And two on the side where they take panels out and, and have a single machine gun on each side. That's 10 machine guns. Uh, now. Go to the next one, please, Stan. Okay, and this is one bomber group, approximately 50 to 60 planes. And the, the, uh, leader, in the, the leader in the bomb group was all the way on the far left. And he was at, at, at usually at a middle range, out, at the middle altitude of say 25,000 feet. And I can't see the numbers up there, but the upper, uh, excuse me, the front leading squadron, okay, and then upper right, the, the, the second squadron, put it on the planes, please, okay, about an equal number, about 2,000 feet above, and the bottom squadron, the third squadron, okay, to the right, and uh, about 2,000 feet below. Now, it is almost impossible to turn that kind of formation unless, and I, I, I'll try to demonstrate it in, as best I can, what happens is the middle goes this way, the top is over here, the bottom is here. And when the, the middle one turns, leads the squadron, the upper squadron to goes over it to the right and the lower squadron goes under it to the left. And that's the only way you can turn. Can you imagine? This is 60 planes only. But can you imagine when it's in a stream of bombers, anywhere from 500 bombers to 1,000, and 1,000 were done daily uh, uh, beginning uh, fall 
of uh, 1944 and the first part of 45. A thousand bombs in a stream like that. And the hardest thing to do with that stream is to turn it 180 degrees and go back. The hardest thing to do. Can you imagine flying uh, passenger planes as they are now and have a stream of uh, a thousand? How, how impossible it would be to turn? But with that system, it was able to be done. Not easily. There were a lot of stragglers, and then they got picked off by the Germans uh, more easily. Anyway, one bomb group. Now, I, uh, where are you going? Guns for bombers, six oh, guns. oh, I got to talk about that, yes. So, the bomber generals were very pleased with the, uh, the B-17 and its 10 guns per plane. They figured that with, uh, say, a, please go back. They figured that with 10 guns per plane, and you've had 60 in each group, that would be 600 guns firing in all directions from the plane. And if you had 600 bombers, which was not a, a high number uh, toward the middle and the end of the war, if you had 600 or even 1,000, let's, I'll go to 1,000, 1,000 bombers in a, in a stream that was almost 100 miles long. And if you had that many bombers with uh, 10 guns apiece, that would be 10,000 guns. And they thought that this hedgehog uh, uh, would have a hedgehog effect and it would be impossible. Go to the next. Uh, they thought it would be impossible for uh, fighter planes to penetrate that kind of firepower going in all directions. Well, okay. So, uh, and I can't read. What, what's the uh, germ? General sent unescorted bombers into Germany. I can't hear you. What did you say? Or should I? I have to this look. This is the Schweinfurt. Uh, yeah, I know that. But it, uh, the general sent. Oh, okay. And it, there was a raid. And it, it was almost a test. And the general was very confident that uh, although the P-47s uh, were short of the range going to Schweinfurt, uh, that the bombers would easily be able to take care of themselves. That last 92 miles or so that the P-47s couldn't accompany them and had to go back because they didn't have the range, they, the, the generals felt that the, B-17s could take care of themselves. And what happened, it was a catastrophe. A catastrophe. And 60 out of the 376 bombers were shot down. That's about 15%. Seven more uh, missions like that, and you wouldn't have an air, uh, you wouldn't have a bomber force. And clearly, a long range fighter, better, long, longer range fighter was needed. Stan, the next one. And it, would, it turned out to be the P-51. And the P-51 had a special new wing, uh, which was thinner than, than the P-47s. It, it sliced through the air much faster. And it had this uh, Rolls-Royce Merlin inline engine, not the round big engine of the P-47, which uh, just had to push the air away almost uh, when it went forward. The, the needle nose P-51 just penetrated the air much faster than the P-47. It was more maneuverable, lighter plane, and so forth. And uh, between the wing and the, the uh, uh, greater, at its uh, speed, the greater range it had, uh, and the, uh, I've got to go to the next, uh, next one, please. Here, oh, here's the wing. Look at the P-47's wing. This is exaggerated only to make the point. It's a thicker wing, 
and the the curve of it uh, at the at its greatest width cross section is toward the front, and it was uh, oh crap. Uh, can can you go along the back top of the of the wing stand along the top? Right now, slide it down to the back. Okay, it is there that the turbulence is created that gives a wing its lift. When it goes, when the, the wing goes through the air, the back part of it lifts the plane. That's what lifts an aeroplane. But with a P-51, the front is thinner, slices through the air better, and then the last part, not a good drawing, but uh, you get the idea. It has less, actually has less lift. But when it goes faster, it has enough lift. And that's, that's the brilliance of, of, of that wing. It was the first time that kind of wing had ever been used, and uh, it worked. It worked. Next, please. All right. Now, remember I said that the P-51 was a lot of afterthoughts, four afterthoughts? The wing was... Uh, well, the first uh, innovation of that kind, so it wasn't an afterthought. The afterthoughts now are adding two external droppable wing tanks that you can drop when you're going into uh, any combat. And they had 110 gallons left, 110 right. That's 220 gallons you have. And it also was added to the rear of, of the uh, plane in the fuselage. They took out some uh, protective metal uh, in the back of the pilot and added a 65-gallon internal tank. And I'll tell you about it. Uh, uh, so you had about 250 gallons to come back because you went into the target all the way on your external tanks. And coming back, you used your internal tanks. The 65-gallon tank in the rear uh, was a problem because it caused the P-51 to go out of balance. Uh, and the pilot sits in the very center of the center of gravity. Along the width of the wing, the midpoint of the wing, he sits right there. And he sits at the midpoint, of course, on the center line of the, of the fuselage. But that 65-gallon tank caused the plane to be tail heavy. So, what was figured out? Uh, we'll use the 65-gallon tank to take off and to climb to beat the bombers, uh, to escort them, and use about uh, 55, 60 gallons of, the, of that too heavy rear tank and put everything in balance. And that's what worked. And... Uh, well, that was the, those are the three, two of the three afterthoughts right there. Okay, next. Oh, by the way, did everybody get that? Yes. Good, okay. Now, here's the range that uh, the P-51 had, P had over the P-47. And uh, sh uh, Stan, please show that swath of, of uh, area, just the whole swath, all the way up to the top to Denmark, all right, that were added to uh, being able to accompany the bombers. The P-47 had a range of, it's right there written, do you see it? Stan, right, right along there, 300 and what? 75. 375 miles range going out. The P-51 had 600 mile range with the P-51. Nothing in Germany, no target in Germany uh, was beyond uh, the reach now of the bombers with full uh, fighter protection. And that was pivotal, pivotal, because if it, we didn't have the P-51 and the, and the range it had to go anywhere, Berlin, Leipzig, Munich, Stuttgart, all, all of uh, the, the interior cities where 95% of, uh, or more, uh, as they moved everything back, uh, of the war production was, was made. Uh, 
the war would have lasted many, many years. No telling how many or, and uh, uh, Germany was uh, uh, doing well until, uh, relatively well, until the P-51 was able to assist the bombers in going anywhere in Germany and attacking bombers uh, that made war production. Okay, next. P oh, so the P-51 replaced all the P-47s. And it replaced them within a month when it was when that terrible mission took place, uh, right after. And the American genius at mass production just turned them out one after the other, one after the other, and uh, it was able to replace uh, the uh, all the P forty sevens. And the uh, is that right? And, the Nazi war production. Yeah, good. Oh, thank you. Okay, next. Uh, let's go a, a little deeper into what the P-51 is. Six machine guns and uh, 80, 84 bullets per second per gun. 84 bullets a second. You take 50, uh, you take 50 caliber bullets and you hold 84 of them in your hand. You've got a handful. And if that hits anything for that second, it just tears right through it. Yes. OK, next. Uh, oh, this was interesting. The guns were uh, angled in to a, hit a point so that the bullets would hit a point 250 yards ahead and then splay out uh, 250 yards uh, further. And. Uh, <coughs> Uh, th this, to me, caused a problem. Uh, uh, I had, uh, Stan, go, go to the next one. I just want to see what happens there. I'm going to highlight this. And you're playing. Yeah, you're playing. I, I know that, Stan. I just, okay. When you uh, uh, fly at, if you're flying at total right angles to your plane, to, to your enemy plane, uh, and you fire directly at it, the bullets won't reach there in time. They will always go behind the plane you're firing. At, at, a, at a tenth of it, at a full second, there are 600, you go 600 feet in a plane when you're flying at 400 miles an hour. And it would be impossible to hit that plane from any distance if you were flying directly at it. And at a tenth of a second, you would be, the, the plane would be 60 feet away. You have to fire in front of the plane, not aim at the plane, but aim your bullet stream in front of the plane by eye. Could never use a, a gun sight uh, in that way uh, and hit a plane the way they, they trained you. And that's the way you hit the plane. You fired in front of it. Of course, when you were firing more behind the plane, you didn't have to worry about that or at a, a shallow angle to the plane because you could just aim at the, at the left side of the plane. The bullets would uh, hit the right side because it would be going at another 60 feet. It would hit in the middle, whatever. And, and that's the way you, uh, that's the way you uh, fired at, at an enemy plane. You fire it where it will be, not where it is. You fire it where it will be and let them fly through the bullet stream. Stan, could you go? Uh, a little bit on uh, combat tactics. You flew in groups of four called flights. Two, two, two elements, uh, a wingman and his, uh, excuse me, a flight leader and his wingman and then the number three and four, and his wingman. And you tried to stay together as much as possible. It was almost impossible to stay together in a melee. And uh, you f uh, when you went into battle formation, uh, you flew about a quarter of a mile apart for each plane uh, in order to give maneuverability, because you can't stick in a flight like that and, and do anything. And next, please. Now, ask the audience. 
what is one thing that's missing in all this? Hello? Pilot. The pilot. Yes. But you're the one who can control how you go and fly in a P-51. You've already learned through primary, through uh, uh, basic, and through advanced flying, your stick and rudder, your stick and rudder works exactly the same in the P-51 as it does in that slow primary flight training that you, that you learn stick and rudder and, uh, and you, uh, oh, your pedals for the rudder, okay? Are you convinced you can fly? Yes. I'd like to hear a real yes, come on. Yes. See, Stan, I told you they were good. Okay, all right. Uh, I can't read the damn thing. Crew of one. Yeah. Oh, you were the pilot, navigator, bombardier, and everything, because uh, you, you could only fit one person in that cockpit, barely. It was, it was a tight cockpit, and uh, I can't read the bottom either. Stan, say something, please. Uh, the combat success depends on teamwork, yeah. initiative, yeah. ability to improv improvise, yeah. aggressiveness, aggressiveness, response. Yeah. There he sits right in front of you. <laughs> no, I'm a pussycat. Okay, next. Uh, flying the P-51. Now, it was non-pressurized. You, you fly today in airliners that are pressurized. You breathe the air, and it seems almost like the same as it on the ground. When you're flying at 25, 30,000 feet, the air is thinner and thinner the higher up you go, and the temperature goes down drastically. Temperature at about uh, 25, 30,000 feet is 60 below. 60 below. If you well, none of you spit, of course, but if you did spit on, on, the, on the floor of the cockpit, by the time the sputum reached the floor of the cockpit, it would be frozen and you'd hear a click. I never heard it, of course. Okay, and uh, there was an effect uh, of... of uh, having the, the, side t uh, the tight seat belt, uh, there were no shoulder straps, uh, just one seat belt as tight as it could be across your, across your thighs and into your belly. And uh, the result was, after a mission when you got out, your buttocks would feel like they would concrete made of concrete, and it was difficult to walk. And it took uh, a good uh, maybe 15 minutes before the, the blood would come into it normally. Uh, the, and uh, it, was, it, it wasn't uncomfortable because you didn't feel a thing when you were flying with this tight thing uh, across your, your, your stomach, across your thighs. Okay, so, so and then... You were flying from five hours to six and yeah. a half hours. Yeah. Uh, politely, can you describe hygiene? <laughs> well, I'll describe it. Uh, yeah, I'll describe it a little bit. Uh, there, there was a tube that uh, came over here, and you're supposed to use it if you had to uh, go to the bathroom. And uh, I tried it once. And... Uh, took off my glove, my hand started to stiffen. I started to take off, there were three parts, to the, uh, three gloves. First is the chamois, then is the silk, and then the third glove is the gauntlet that you see there. I, I took off the gauntlet and my hand started to stiffen. I, I could hardly take off the silk. I gave up because I could hardly get my hand back into the gauntlet because my my fingers were like this, and I never tried it again. That's all. You understand what to do in hygiene. <laughs> okay. And the other part is forget about it. That's all. Okay. Next.
<laughs> Next. Flying a mission. Now, now you've learned to fly the P-51, right? Yes. Okay, now you're going on a mission. Is that okay? Yes. Doesn't matter, you're told to go on the mission. Okay. Uh, and the night before the first mission, at least for me, I, I was nervous. I was very, very nervous. Uh, but I figured after the mission, that first mission, I can do it again if I did it once. And that's one at a time. Yeah. Uh, night before. Here's what you put. You you, before you go to sleep, you put on your, you put on your, uh, some fresh underwear. Then you put on, put over it your uh, long johns. Then you put on two pair of socks, two pair of socks. And on the right, and you, oh, you keep on uh, at all times when, when uh, uh, you're flying, your dog tags, which tells your name, rank, serial number, and religion, Catholic, Protestant, and Hebrew, H for Jewish, okay. And uh, you, I can't see the other things. Wristwatch. Wristwatch, yes. Thank you. You can call it out. Uh, okay. And no other ID. No evidence where you're from. No evidence of your unit or anything like that in case you're captured. And uh, you're never supposed to reveal anything like that. Okay, next. Uh, now you're suiting up. Okay, first thing. Put on uh, your shirt and tie. We wore a tie, I swear. We wore ties. Some guys didn't, but I did. Who knows when you might need a tie? To, to. <laughs> and you're laughing. You think it's uh, for something pleasant. No, you need it in case you need a tourniquet, something, if you got damage flying, uh, uh, bailing out, and uh, you were bleeding or something. Okay, so. You, I can't read the escape damn. Photo. What, what is an escape photo? Okay, escape photo, you're going to find out in the next uh, uh, sequence. But there you see the A2 jacket that I wore, and there's my flight suit. Over there, on the far side, is the flight suit I wore. If you can see it, yeah. Yeah. you can. And the A2 jacket hanging. Okay? Okay. And in there also, oh, I'd like to show that, is my Aunt Rose's knitted sweater. She, yes, uh, she said it would, it will help you if it's cold and it'll keep you safer. Uh, and I wore it and I thought of her during the flights and it helped, it helped. But no, Aunt Rose was always thinking of me, sure, and I'd be safer, yeah. Okay, uh, all right, you put on your, two, I can't see anything. My eyes, incidentally, I have macular degeneration, I can't, I can't see a goddamn thing. You put on thing. your flight suit. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we wore the same GI shoes that, that the ground troops wore, they were excellent. I didn't wear boots, I put on the third uh, uh, pair of socks. Uh, uh, and uh, they fit in, in, in those uh, GI shoes, which were excellent, could last, if I ever bailed out, they could last me a long time. Uh, 45 pistol, the... Uh, what was in the escape kit? Oh, the escape kit. It was a little tin, almost like a sardine can, and in it, it had some aspirin, some, something, uh, pills that would give you energy, any extra energy. They were called uppers. And uh, needle and thread, believe it or not. Compass, little compass. Uh, uh, some chocolate, and it was supposed to be high energy chocolate. Uh, little, little couple of slabs of that. And uh, I forget what else, but it's things like that that were very small and would help you uh, stay awake uh, and 
have uh, some nourishment for the first few days that you might be trying to escape. Yeah. Did you ever shoot your pistol? No, but I could throw it at you and kill you. <laughs> it was, it was so heavy that forty-five gun. Yes, very heavy. Bill, could you just talk about the glassine map? Oh, oh yes. Uh, I could show it to you over there. Maybe you can see me here and I'll stand up. Can you see this part of my pants? Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's a, on that flight suit, there's a little glassine uh, sewn on. You can see through the glassine and under it would have a map of Germany, a very small map of Germany. And in, in the, uh, uh, where you were briefed, it would, uh, they would tell you uh, you, uh, the the flight plan, you're going out 45 degrees, this was 60 degrees, this was this way, this way, this way, and back. Just the headings. And that's all you had to know. Well, if you knew the headings, you, you, you could uh, know where you are in the flight at all times and be able to get back. Yeah, by yourself. Uh, I think that's enough there, isn't it? What about the leg knife? The what? Leg knife. Oh, that was over here. Yeah, it, it, there's a spot when you can see it on, 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 on the flight suit where the, the, the knife would be over here. No, it's not a Bowie knife. It's a, it's, it, it's a, uh, it was on the end of a, a rifle. What is it called? A bayonet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else? No, I can go to the next one, right? Yep. Okay. Continuing. In the ready room, you put on your G-suit. What is a G-suit? It fits over here, it, around you, tight, and on your thighs, right and left thighs, tight, and it blows up when you're in a, in a dive and trying to pull out of a dive because the blood rushes from your head, away from your head, and you will black out. You've heard of things, pilots blacking out, that, that's what happens. And with the G-suit, it blows up your, your diaphragm here and, and uh, blows up on your thigh, and it keeps the blood up a little longer. That's all. Next. You're in the ready room. You're in the ready room. Parachute. Oh, put on the parachute, yeah, good. Uh, you put on the final, the gloves, the final gauntlet. Uh, I can't see down there. Well, they call it a Mae West inflatable uh, life jacket. Uh, they call it a Mae West because it fits more over the top of you, uh, like Mae West's, uh, you know. <laughs> and, and, oh, there it is. Okay. No, it's not on that picture. I'm just in front of the plane, uh, and uh, uh, you're going to see something a little further on. Oh, what? what? Oh, no. The helmet with go the back. Go, go forward, please. And, uh, trying to find the, okay, uh, then. This is the way we went out to the flight line. Those jeeps were wonderful. You, you could uh, fit uh, 10 or 12 pilots on. We had two jeeps, and we can uh, fill them with uh, enough pilots to fit the the, the 20 or so that were needed uh, for our squadron when we went out uh, uh, on a mission. Next. Uh, next. Bill, were you assigned to fly the night before or the morning of? The night before. Yes. Good question. Yeah, it had, it had an effect. And uh, you, you knew not to do something the night before to uh, drink too much or, or stay up late. And you, you prepared for the mission by going to bed early. Okay. Not too early, but early. Okay. Uh, was this up before? I can't. No. Okay. Checklist. checklist. Damn. I'd like to show you, that, uh, tell you, but I'm, I'm not capable of reading this damn thing. Uh, it says before can you say it, please, yeah. uh, Stan? Before taxiing out, you'll hook up the radio and yeah. the helmet earphones yeah. 
and I'm just going to highlight. Oh, that's good. The helmet, yeah. And then she was hooked up. You would set the seat height. Yeah, I had to raise it very high. Mask, and you turn on the radio mic, which was in the mask. Could I you, could I stop you there just a little bit, yeah. Stan, if you don't mind? You will notice the oxygen mask hanging off my face. Uh, that covering is chamois because if you had the that rubberized oxygen mask pushed against your face, it would sweat and it'd be very uncomfortable. But with the chamois, it worked well. And the microphone is right in the oxygen mask, that little round thing at the bottom. That's the microphone, intercom microphone with other planes in your squadron. And to the left of that, you can see a uh, what looks like a silver handle. Uh, that's the when you jump out, you pull that. That's the ripcord for the parachute. No, you're not there. Are you there? No, you have to be in. Yeah. Do you see it? No. Oh, okay. I'm not going to. Oh, there it is. Yeah, well, you can see it there, too. No, that's that's just tightening the parachute. That's, that, that's not it. It's it's upper. It's above that. Believe me, we had a handle to pull the parachute. Okay. Okay. Now, preparing for... In the cockpit. Okay. Tell them about your rear view mirrors. Oh, yes, you have to adjust. There were three rear, thank you, three rear, rear view mirrors. A left one up here to look to the right side, a right one up here to look to the left side, and a central one to look directly back. You were looking at those rear view mirrors as much as you were, more, in fact, than you were watching, uh, glancing at the dials. That was what was more important. You could see forward and left and right easily, but you needed the back to help uh, if you were a, uh, a wingman for yourself and if you were the flight leader uh, to also sort of glance at your wingman, make sure he was in position. Bill, every pilot is taught to use a checklist. Why, why didn't you? Uh, we, we didn't have checklists. It was all memory. The, we counted on the crew chief to have the plane in shape in every way. The checklist is for, uh, is, is for checking the engine and, uh, and, and knowing how much, uh, uh, loading the bullets, make, make sure you're, you're, you're fully uh, uh, equipped with enough bullets sometimes. Sometimes it... Uh, so basically yeah. the crew chief. Crew chief did everything, and, and he didn't have a checklist. I never heard of one, but every plane I, I ever flew, and any that any pilot ever flew, I never heard a complaint about a crew chief. We had excellent, excellent, conscientious fellows uh, who were doing that as crew chiefs. And they pulled the last pull on, on, on the, the seat belt. That was the last thing. And uh, we shook hands. Yeah. Next. Uh, you taxied out to the runway in oh. order of takeoff? Yes, in order of takeoff. And you sat there until the flare went up. When, and that, when that happened, the uh, uh, flight leader of, of the entire group went on to the runway. You went on in twos, and you took off in twos in formation and uh, in that way you could get the 60 plane 50 or 60 planes up in the air in half the time and in about three minutes we had the full three squadrons ready to go out to uh, rendezvous with the bombers on the Dutch coast usually yeah. uh, go oh when you uh, on the throttle well, I just wanted to point out that in three minutes, 60, 50 to 60 planes took off. Three minutes, 50 to 60 planes got in the air. That's amazing. Yeah, in formation, as you will see.
Yeah, because the, the flight leader would do a large circle around the airfield and you would cut him off as, as you came off the, uh, uh, the, the uh, runway. You would turn and cut him off because he was flying the big circle so you could go in whatever spot you were lo uh, supposed to locate your flight. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the 355th fighter group. Oh, big decision. General Doolittle, you may remember, was the fellow who went to Tokyo for that very important morale raid uh, over Japan. Anyway, he was able to come back uh, when he bailed out over China, and uh, he, he was a, a, a real hero, uh, and uh, he was a lieutenant uh, colonel when he went on that raid. It was a suicide mission, and he came back okay. And he was made a brigadier general and sent over to the 8th Air Force in England to uh, head fighter command, and fighter command... Uh, was under the, the orders of the bomber generals because fighter command was subordinate to uh, the bomber generals. And they insisted that the fighters, uh, P-51s or P-47s, stay with, stay with the uh, bombers until they were attacked, which was exactly the wrong way to, to uh, uh, defend the bombers. Uh, and Doolittle changed that, and uh, he had enough clout with Washington, with Roosevelt. He had enough clout to over uh, uh, to overrule the bomber generals. And he said, "The fighters, as soon as you see enemy aircraft, no matter how little or how many, you attack, because attackers determine the start of the battle. You determine." when and where you are going to attack. It's a major thing to get the first shots off at, at the uh, enemy uh, in terms of who's going to win any, any battle. And he said, you attack on sight. Aggressiveness was an important factor. Attack on sight. And it worked. Oh, I should say that. Uh, there were fewer uh, bomber losses and a few more uh, fighter uh, victories with that now. Okay, now, oh, I can read that. Now you know all you need to know to fly a P-51 uh, to protect the bombers and your comrades. Congratulations. Good. You did it. You did it. You did it. Okay, any questions? Any questions? I can't see. Brenda, uh, so the bombers were on a different airfield. Did they take off first because they were slower yes. and heavier? Yes. And when they got to a certain point, then the P-51s came because they were quicker and could catch up with them at a certain yes. point? Yes. Good. Nobody stopped in midair to wait. <laughs> <laughs> they, they took off about an hour earlier, and you could hear them. Uh, uh, on their base, which Bassingbourne was about five miles away. You could hear them and you knew there was going to be a mission when the bombers uh, revved up their engines. And uh, so we... What does the P stand for? Pursuit. It used to stand for... And now it stand, F stands for fighter. It, it's supposed to give a, a greater range of, of duties when you use the F, uh, which was started, uh, I don't know, Korean War or soon after. Any other? Have, Go ahead. Yeah, Bill, I have a question. Um, uh, all of the dog pack tags, the dog tags had the uh, letter for what religion they were. So if you had an H yes. on your dog tag, would that pose a problem if you were captured by the Germans? Yes, supposedly it would. Some guys didn't wear their dog tags. I don't think so. Some guys did not. I did. Okay, question. What? Hi, Bill. I'm Donna. I have a question. I know how to fly the plane up and down and left and right. Good. But I don't know how to land. Right now. 
I can't understand a word you you're saying. How do you land it, Bill? How do you land it? Uh, he wants to know how to land a plane. Oh, uh, all right. You, uh, you know what your stick does? You point down toward the airfield when you're going down. All right. As you near the airfield, you use your rudder pedals and, and, and your stick rudder combined. You go to the right a little bit and circle, and then you go to the left to go straight with your, with your stick. You go around the airfield, and you come in on the runway you're going at. What we use, let me explain it better. When we came in uh, to land, we landed in fours. And we buzzed the, the uh, edge of the air, uh, runway. We went up, and each plane would go up and, and wide around. Second one up and further wide around. Up four planes coming in one after the other. And uh, I don't need to tell you how you use your stick and rudder at this point. But you went toward the airfield. Slower and slower and slower. The P-51 was, was not easy to land because you couldn't see in front of you when you tried to make your three-point landing, and that was the prized way to make it, not on the wheels, make it in three-point lightly so you, you, don't, you do the least damage when you... Uh, some guys came in on the wheels and uh, I, I thought they hurt the plane, but you come in slowly, 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 and you look, you look out the right eye, and you look out the left eye at the same time, like this, almost, because you can't see in front of you. And you get used to it, so you know wh wh how far you are away from the right side of the runway, you know how far you are from the left side of the runway, and you look at, now you're looking really at, at your airspeed. You don't want to drop below 90, because the air will be going over the plane, curved wings, enough to keep you up. You want to land at about 90, going forward, using a little bit of, of uh, uh, more, more gas on your throttle, then, then less gas, more gas, more gas, less gas, doing that gradually until it just drops so nice, right, and three points, and you you roll and you lift up. Oh, I put. I didn't put down my flaps. I was wrong. I put down your flaps to make your speed lower all the way down in your descent. And I, as soon as it touches the ground, you lift up your flaps and you have no uh, push up from your flaps to to uh, uh, keep you in the air. And that's a good landing. <laughs> Put down the wheels after you land. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yes. You put thank you. Oh gosh. <laughs> the question about parachuting. Did you in your training, did you uh did you train uh, did I did I do an experimental uh, parachute jump? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Nobody did that I know of. And, and no other, no other training or preparation for your. No, they were for parachute uh, soldiers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How about evasion? If what? Did you do any training on evasion once you parachuted down? What you did after that? If no. You like enemy territory. No. And there was no uh, fighter. Uh, uh, fighter to fighter training in practically no fighter to fighter training in uh, in training. You did it when you got into combat or when you're doing missions. Well we shot at a sleeve, you know, one plane shooting at, at a sleeve that was pulled by an AT six and your bullets uh, would uh, be painted red at the front so you could see that your plane got so many red bullets on the uh, red bullets hit the sleeve that a tow plane was pulling, uh, and uh, another plane would have 
green painted on the front of the bullet, so everybody knew how many bullets they were they so were you hitting. Washed out of your bullets hit the tow plane, right? I didn't hear that. <laughs> and you washed out if your bullets hit the tow plane instead. <laughs> that happened, yes, and uh, yeah, it did happen. It was on, on, you know, sometimes they were accidents. <laughs> Bill, you have some more slides. What do you want to do? Well, what, what's our time? Um, 3.45. It's now 3.45. So how long have we been talking? Oh, maybe an uh, hour and a quarter. Are you, you want to hear more or not? Yay! Yay! Let's go. I have a question. Oh. Um, it's for Ann McLaughlin. And Hi. my question is, uh, you were a fighter pilot, but who made the determination whether you would be a bomber pilot or a fighter pilot? How did you oh. decide? Okay, good question. That was decided after uh, basic training, uh, basic flight training. Uh, it was decided on judgment by uh, your, your uh, instructors and their recommendations. How well you flew. Some guys just were natural much more natural and, and able to, to do uh, maneuvers than, than others. Some guys were, sl not sl I don't want to say slower, but they were much more careful, much more careful. But there were, there were some who wouldn't hesitate to rev the, the engine right to the red line to do things and, and, uh, and others who were more careful of the plane. They became bomber pilots. I think. Were cautious and the other yeah. Were okay. You could put it that way. It was considering the the pilot's mentality too. Mm -hmm. And they were daredevils. No, nobody wanted to to die. Oh. Lights. What? Someone turn down the lights. Turn down the lights. Lights. Okay. You asked. Me. Okay. Okay, that's 1942. I graduated high school. What, 1944? What? What? Hold on one second. Am I talking? The microphone. Is okay. it okay now? Yeah, not so okay. okay. I had hair. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Next, uh, I was born in Bayshore, Long Island, 1924, 1927. My dad joined a Wall Street firm. We was very made a lot of money. He hated it. He said it was like a license to steal. That's what he said. And he became a public school teacher. Yeah, shop teacher, seventh and eighth grade, and he loved it. Anyway, oh, he graduated from. Uh, Columbia with a master's and uh, CCNY with a bachelor's. Uh, hold, hold on that, the whole thing. Okay, oh, that's me. Uh, at, at, uh, at a, I guess about one and I was sucking my thumb. But when you got your wings, you had to stop sucking your thumb. <laughs> okay, that's, that's my mother to the right, my dad standing up, my grandma, Grandma Elias to the left. Yeah, that's my dad and me. That's my dad. And my mom, my mom over there, and I was about nine. Are you an only child? Yes, yes. I'll mention something, and it's, I think, very important. The hardest thing I ever did, uh, almost in my life, was to leave my mom and dad to go into the service. And it was the hardest thing for them to give me their approval at 18. Uh, if I hadn't had my cousin, Sylvan Feld, who was uh, the leading American ace in the, uh, after the uh, North African invasion, he had nine victories. Uh, and he came and talked to my dad on his leave when he knew, he, well, we were always in touch that I planned, I'd like to become a fighter pilot. He told my dad I, he thought I would do 
all right. He thought I would be all right as a fighter pilot. Yeah. There he is, Sylvan Feld, my cousin. And he was my first babysitter. Do you see we're sitting in that horse and buggy? Uh, he, he's holding me. He's, and it's a, a metaphor as the way he treated me as, a, as his, his baby in charge. He was in charge of me. And he was only eight. And he used, he used to take care of me and hold my hand. And he wouldn't let go. He, I tried. To try. He would never let go. That's what mom said. Always hold his hand. Don't let him run around. Just hold his hand. My, my good cousin. He was killed. Uh, he was, uh, he now had his own squadron, Major Silvenfell. And he was shot down over, over Normandy uh, by flak, anti-aircraft fire. He was able to bail out. He was picked up by the Marquis right away, taken to a safe house. And uh, there was, at the safe house, there was a, a Canadian pilot who had been shot down. And the Canadian pilot uh, was from Quebec and could speak French. And it was decided that the two of them would get bicycles from, from the Marquis and they would try to pedal to uh, Spain, uh, across France, uh, because Spain was neutral and they could get a boat and, and go back to England and rejoin their squadrons. And uh, they were pedaling along this, uh, this line of uh, armor, of Germ German armor. And P-51 planes came over and uh, there was a, some bombing also and uh, Sylvan was shot and killed. And he, the Canadian got one of his dog tags and took it back and that's how he found out. And that's where he's buried. That's his grave in the American Armored Ard Ardennes Cemetery in uh, in Belgium. That's where he is. Uh, oh, that's the escape photo on the right. Uh, and it was taken supposedly in Sunday best peasant garb. Little of it is shown and it was kept in your shirt pocket. I think it said so right at the beginning of what you wore kept in your shirt pocket, and if you bailed out over France or Belgium or uh, Luxembourg, it, it was useful uh, because you would almost certainly uh, get picked up by the Marquis if you, you know, bailed out in the rural areas. And uh, they would put it in the local district identification paper that everybody had to carry uh, who were uh, t taken over uh, when when Germany uh, ruled over those areas uh, during the German occupation, and that's it. Next, oh, that's my plane. I uh, Tiger's Revenge, and it was revenge. And I'm sorry to I use that word. But it's I I would like it. Uh, so yeah, I, it was my dad and uncle. My dad and Sylvan. I'm sorry. And that was a Jeep incident. Tell us about the Jeep incident. Yeah. What? What? It's moving the microphone. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Keep sliding on. There we go. Oh. Thanks. What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, this is interesting, I guess. Okay. Uh, I wasn't on this mission. I went to the briefing anyway, because I wanted to go to London, and I thought I could get a ride from some of the drivers who uh, would be at the briefing, after the briefing. And I got into the briefing room, and my commanding officer came rushing over to me, uh, Colonel Elder, and he said, I want you to go back to the barracks and pick up my musette bag. I left it on the bed. Bring it here now, now. Uh, take the Jeep. And uh, I said, I, I can't. And yes, you can. You're not on a mission. Go. I don't know how to drive. 
and he said, his jaw dropped. You can't drive an automobile and, and you're flying uh, P-51s and come. No, I, I come from Brooklyn. We always took the subway. It cost, <laughs> it, it, it cost, li listen, listen, listen. It cost a nickel and you could go anywhere with transfers in the whole city. No London for you. You get checked out in, in the Jeep by the time I got back uh, from the mission. And that's the way it was. I didn't go to London. I called a sergeant who had the two Jeeps and, uh, and, uh, and, and he, after the planes all took off, we went to the runway. He showed me how to use the stick shift and the choke if you had to, and, and the brake was here, and the clutch was here, and uh, we drove up and down the runway for about 10 or 15 minutes, and he said, okay, take it back to the ready room after you're done. You have it for the rest uh, of the time you want. And that's how I learned to drive a car. <laughs> In safety, no lights, no nothing. <laughs> okay. Oh, that. Uh, see that middle thing? That was a uh, in the New York Times, and it showed four of the pilots uh, from the New York area who shot down planes that day. My mother saw it, and she wrote me every day, every day, and she never told me. And I never told her I was on any missions, and I wrote every day. I, I told her I was going to visit London, I was going to see Buckingham Palace. I, I told her so many things. I was going to the Cotswolds, and uh, we kidded each other, I think, all the way until the end of the war. And then she told me, well, then she told me some things I... I didn't know. My dad insisted on coming on the subway with me when I went to enlist. Uh, and he insisted on that, insisted. And uh, my mother said she cried when we both left the apartment. And uh, when dad came back, they both cried together. Can you imagine that, hearing that? Your mom and dad crying. What? Again? Okay. Get a little closer to your mouth. Thank you. Okay. All right, that, that's enough. Oh, look at that. That's the Messerschmitt ME262. It's as modern and as sleek as any plane now. It was the, any plane in the, in, 2024 now, it was the first jet. Oh, when we saw that, we were astonished. It was going about 200 miles an hour faster than we were, as if we were standing still, in the same way as if the bombers were standing still when we zigzagged, zigzagged over them. I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, I, I, uh, it was, it, it was near Munich. I was, uh, Leading yellow flight uh, on that mission, and it, it came it came over us, going in the opposite direction. The the, the closure was about eight hundred miles an hour. It was going so we couldn't believe how fast it was. It was astonishing to see that thing flying so fast, and we heard about it that it didn't have a propeller. How could it do it? But it came over, circled back to try to get to the bombers. And I was able to cut it off and, and fire at it. I got a couple of shots, just a couple flashes. You could tell the flashes. But then it went up, up, and away. And I, I tried to follow it full throttle, full everything. Full. And it just outran the bullets, outran them. And it went, the bullets were like this by that time. You know, not in that uh, uh, picture you saw. Uh, where they're 500 uh, yards ahead, but they were, they were way out like this in this, and he was in the middle, way off, and I, I couldn't get him. And when I got back, I spoke to 
uh, Colonel Elder. I said, we should straighten out the guns and let the bullets just fire forward. We don't, we, we'll get everything we got, even if, it, if you had that point 250 yards in front where they all met. And he said, no, no, I, no. And I, I tried to argue with him. And he gave me his explanation why it was better to keep it this way. And that's what he said. I like it this way. <laughs> and that was his total explanation. But I understood it. I understood his total explanation. Okay. There you go. Oh. Sixty-three total. Yeah. I was very lucky. I was. Oh, the new suit. When we got back, when I got back. Yeah. New suit. Not my car. I couldn't afford a car. And uh, th those are, that's a reunion on the right. Some of the guys from B Flight were still alive, and they're, they're on the right. B Flight is on the left. That's the barracks that we lived in. Yeah. Most of us were high school grads. Only one guy had college. Oh, there's Mark, Mark Murphy. And there's. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the present P-51, which is stationed, station, which is uh, uh, parked in uh, Brookhaven, uh, Long Island. The, uh, there's a fellow there who, he, he's a billionaire. He collects World War II fighter planes. And he named, uh, because of Mark Murphy, he named, uh, his P-51, uh, Tiger's Revenge, and with the colors of the 357 fighter squadron on it. And he has a Zero, he has a Messerschmitt, he has a Spitfire, he has a Hellcat, oh gosh. Is his name Lauder? Yes. Lauder? The, uh, the cosmetic there? Yeah. Who on the plane? He's a wealthy guy. That's all. Carol! <laughs> oh. There's Carol in the back. Yeah. Is that your alternate flight uniform? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got to tell this is a joke, but it's serious. I used to be 5'7", and you could see by it. The, what I wore when I stand up, I hold it next to me, and then there was about a half a foot in, of leg I'm not using when I, it, it's flat on the ground when I hold that up. Uh, and uh, I've shrunk. I've shrunk. My backbone from my th uh, throat to, to my hips has collapsed a lot. Uh, and uh, my belt is coming up, and if I Last a few more years longer. I'm going to be all pants. <laughs> There's reunion. Oh, I got to tell you about that uh, in Steeple Morden uh, reunion for the 355th Fighter Group Association. And if you can go to the right above there, to the right all the way. You see that stained glass one? Can you focus on the stained glass one? Yeah. That's at the Norman Church at Steeple Morton, which is almost a thousand years old. And there's never been a, they never wanted to make any kind of change in that church. 
And because uh, we were stationed there, 355th Fighter Group, they have a P-51 in a stained, a new stained glass window. Only two stained glass windows, as far as I know, in that whole church. And they made a special one for the, uh, for us, the 355th Fighter Group. We were treated very well. Uh, there, there you can see the uh, uh, stained glass one. And the, there's a P-51 in the upper right, and in the upper, well, you can't see the upper left. Uh, it's a P-47. And that's Carol and me at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's enough, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that presentation from Bill Tiger Lyons. Uh, he is truly a remarkable individual. And if you tune into Social Flight Live in an upcoming episode, just go to socialflightlive, one word, dot com. You can register and you'll be able to join us for our interview with Bill Lyons as he comes on the show. He is truly, again, a remarkable individual. And I will say, uh, you know, his aircraft is called Tiger's Revenge. That is the name of the P-51 Mustang that he flew, that he had uh, painted in that livery, and that Mark Murphy, the aircraft that uh, Mark Murphy flies that we saw down in Long Island is painted as a replica in that. And uh, Tiger's Revenge actually is in honor of uh, Bill's cousin, Sylvanfeld, um, who was killed uh, in 1944 in France and who himself was an amazing P-47 pilot uh, who was the leading ace at the time that he uh, was killed. A truly amazing story. You can look up Sylvan Felt as well. And uh, I'm very excited because one of the things that Bill did for us is he signed a piece of the aircraft here that we're building, our Titan T-51D Mustang, bears the signature of Bill Tiger Lyons inside of it. And uh, that is a true honor. Uh, to have that be part of, of all the things that we're doing. And uh, he was pretty excited to see some of the pictures of, of what we're doing here. And so I hope you enjoyed that. And with that, I wish you all blue skies. <laughs>